When stepping over a certain threshold within this hobby, you find yourself considering your system from start to finish. So, let's build a system together, you and I. We start with the source, obviously. Being a computer, such as a Mac Mini behind me, or a laptop, some people go even further and include something like a streamer, such as the Zenstream behind me, to completely mitigate the source from the graphics cards, etc., inside the units of computers. Then we have USB cleaners, then DAC, then an amplifier. Sometimes there's a pre before the amplifier, then speakers, headphones, IEMs, and then the insanity begins with interconnects, power conditioners, and then you end up with a desk such as this. But the British company IFI said, okay, we produce within our company all of these components. Let's ram it all inside a box. Let it be portable in the sense you can take it places with you so that you can set up in a hotel or a vacation home, etc., and not mitigate anything. Introducing the IFI Pro IDSD signature. Have they succeeded? Let's find out. So, you pay £2,799. I've seen it go as high as £3,200. A special thank you to IFI for sending this unit in for review. And this is what you get. A very, very small unit. But we're going to investigate the other things that are in the box first. You get an aluminium remote with functional buttons. Looks very much like the first generation Apple TV remote. Then we get some feet and a variety of adapters such as going from coax to optical, a tool to change some of the settings at the back of the unit, which we'll discuss in a minute, and some feet for this unit. And then, obviously, they provide this mammoth brick, which is the IFI iPro Elite power supply. It's a linear power supply, probably one of the best I have ever seen come with a device. This uh, unit alone is like 350 pounds. Well done, IR5, for adding it to the bundle and not going, okay, you have to purchase this yourself. Okay, uh, we've avoided the unit enough. I think we should have a look at this little tiny marvel. This thing weighs 1.97 kilograms. It's tiny. It's probably one of the most compact units I've seen. I honestly don't know how they've achieved it. So, let's start with the back of the unit. Here we have the following. We have our analog outputs. First of all, it's the balanced XLR output. Now, this XLR output is variable. So you have fixed to go straight into an amplifier with its own volume knob. You have pre, which you can obviously use to power your studio monitors, such as the ones behind me that have no volume knob, obviously. And then there is another option that is attached to these outputs, which is for the studio. The voltage in this situation goes up exponentially, so do not, under any circumstances, use this at home, unless you have, for example, an amplifier that can support studio-esque voltages, which is, I believe, around 12 volts or something insane, like the benchmark AHB2 behind me. I had to drop the voltage on the DAC freebie, that thing was out of 12 volts originally, which was a bit terrifying. Uh, then we have the single-ended RCA outs, and then we have the interesting things. Ethernet, to use this unit as a standalone streamer. Wi-Fi, coinciding with the Ethernet to use as a streamer. A very good start. Then we have USB, this is to connect hard disks and thumb drives for your data. Music, obviously, and to use it as a standalone unit again. So you can just plug it in, plug your headphones in, not needing any laptop or anything. That, for mobile usage, like in a hotel, is incredible. And then we have a USB 3 connection data, obviously. Um, 
The USB and all of the other digital inputs in this unit are galvanically isolated to emit noise. They've got their own filters, such as the other filters that IFI actually produces as standalone units, which is a wonderful thing. Well done for putting it in here. Uh, obviously, we have uh, coax and we have uh, AES. And interestingly, we have a pair of BNC inputs. These are for word clocks so that it can emit jitter or basically provide a better clock for the unit when daisy chaining inside the studio. I don't think you're going to be using this unless you really, really are kind of uh, picky about your clocks and stuff in a home environment. Uh, obviously, we discussed this. This was the wireless aerial that screws on. And then we have the power connections, DC. Uh, also, there is a pass-through power connection that you can use to daisy chain, for example, the ICANN with the Elite. But I recommend not doing so. I mean, you can, but I recommend not doing so. We spent hundreds of pounds, if not thousands of pounds on power supplies. Don't share that bloody thing. Genuinely, don't share it. Um, um, just, just my take on that. I wouldn't share the power supply for this with anything else, personally. So, that's the rear of the unit. I mean, look at the front of the unit. These vents are for heat, obviously, but this thing doesn't get too hot. The, what were you? The Enlium, Enlium 23R, that thing is a monster. Let's talk about some of the unit's functionality, specifications, and software. Starting with what everything does on this unit. Obviously, we have the low gain, medium gain, high gain. Medium gain adds 9 dB of gain. High gain, 18 dB of gain for your hard to drive headphones. And then on the other side, the same type of switch, we have solid state, tube and tube plus to activate the pair of GE5670S selectively chosen tubes for this unit. You can't uh, roll the tubes in this because you have to literally dismantle the entire thing. I don't think it would be a bit of a hassle, but the tubes inside here sounds pretty okay, pretty nice. Then we have these two buttons and jog wheels simultaneously. You can go from USB, hard disk, ethernet, and app connectivity, and obviously the BNC for the word clock inputs. And uh, there you get obviously optical here as well because it's it's counting the um, coax as optical as well because you can connect it with an adapter. Simultaneously, jogging this like this changes those inputs. You can hold down the button to change the brightness and polarity. And then we have this other jog wheel, including button here. This one, if you push it in, you could upsample to DSD at 512, which is 22 megabits, and then 1024, which is around 45 megahertz or megabits. This jog wheel next to the big one, you could upsample to 512 DSD and 1024, 22 megabits and 45, respectively. And obviously, uh, press it again to go back to PCM. But if you turn the jog wheel, you get the following filters. BitPerfect, BitPerfect Plus, GTO, which is IFI's own proprietary filter, and then we have Appadizing. I think they use that in AKM chips a lot, uh, DACs that include AKM chips. Uh, I could be mistaken. Uh, I've come across that name before, that filter before. And then we have the transient lined, exactly the same manner of the cord products with 16,000 taps. I think that covers everything within the front of the unit. Inside this unit, they're using four DAC Burr Brown chips in an interleaved configuration for transparency. We have an FPGA to control all the upsampling akin to the cord line of products, again. We have four watts at 16 ohms and 1.73 watts. The four mentioned five filters. Circling around to the bit perfect NOS mode in this unit. We need to clarify something. Delta Sigma DACs cannot produce NOS. Only ladder DACs can do this. While initially it bypasses the upsampling filter, the modulator is still active. And though you get an output looking like NOS, it's not actually true NOS. 
the May behind me, the May KTE from Holo Audio, because the latter DAC can do true NOS. Delta Sigma DACs, as a rule, are between 1 and 6 bits, and this gives a dynamic range of, I believe, around 36, if I'm not mistaken. And the ability of Delta Sigma DACs doing NOS, and uh, the reason why they don't, is beyond my pay grade. It literally is rather complicated, but I will link an article by my friend Cam from Golden Sounds describing why Delta Sigma DACs as a rule cannot do NOS at all. They will output something that looks initially like NOS, but it's not true NOS. And I believe this is due to that how many bits that the Delta Sigma DACs are, which is between one and six, obviously. So, just to clarify that, Look down at the article below to actually get a full in-depth clarification of what NOS is, why Delta Sigma DAX can't do NOS, and what Delta Sigma DAX actually do when they say they are doing NOS. Just a side note. I think that covers pretty much the software and the hardware of the unit, and I'm pretty sure I have missed half of it. So I will link below as well IFI's pamphlet on the in-depth functions of this unit as well, because we need to move on to the sound. Okay, this unit has not been tested in an echo chamber by itself. This unit has been put up against the Chord TT2, the Holo Audio May, the Chord Dave, the DAC3B. Not only this, but the headphones that have passed through here since this unit had arrived for review, which has been at least 12 weeks now, has been the following. LCD5, Susvara's, Elite, D8000 Pro, and everything else we reviewed on the channel in the last three months. So look down the list. Anything you see down there has been heard on this unit. Let's get an overall impression of how this unit performs. Because there are so many functionality, obviously. In solid state mode, it's got an intimate stage, yet it can reach out when it needs to. But as most of the time, the sound stage is intimate, detailed, transparent, with a leading edge on the treble region so that you get all the aspects of the information in this category. Uh, you can definitely tell that this could be used very, very easily in a studio environment because it really does emphasize artifacting, emphasizes the problems that can occur in the treble region. It's a very transparent DAC. It's a very powerful little unit. Um, and its sound characteristics leans towards the analytical more than the musical when you're in the solid state form. This is using the Transient Alliant filter, the 16,000 taps. Obviously, all of these filters can be bypassed if you're upsampling yourself using something like the HQ player app. That includes the DSD, because DSD upsampling in this uh, obviously is uh, upsampling to PCM first and then converting to DSD. So that conversion is actually happening in the FPGA inside this unit. Oh, another little cool thing we forgot to mention, which is basically uh, when you switch this unit off and then switch it back on, the volume goes back to exactly where you left it previously if you switched it off and on when the volume was at a specific point in the rotor. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. In this unit, they're using Japan's rotary potentiometer. It's pretty good. It's pretty damn great. It level matches very, very well. As you're going up the volume, uh, there is no left or right imbalances at all, uh, using this with IEMs, especially the sensitive ones. But anyway, going back to the sound. Transparent, leading edge of attack in the treble region a little bit, so it's a little bit sharp, but not in a fatiguing, sibilant kind of way, more in the energy kind of way. Its edge of attack is rather violent and rather aggressive. Um, it's very, 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 very transparent. It's very detailed. Obviously, this being using the 16,000 tap filter, the long filter. Now, these filters do make a little difference to the performance. Some collapse the stage a little bit, some expand the stage a bit, some roll off the treble a little bit. 
um, but it's so subtle and it's on the edge of hearing, I think most people would choose one and leave it 99% of the time. And on this unit, we left it on the long filter being the 16,000 taps. It gave the most balanced, the most reference sound. So I changed it to that and I left it where it was. Tried some of the others. I don't think they performed as well. I think some of them rolled off a little bit at the top end. Some of them sounded a bit dull, uh, especially uh, the bit perfect and the bit perfect plus. I Those were not to my liking due to the discussion we just had previously. Um, you do get some artifacting in the treble region. It just happens. Um, unless you have a ladder DAC and those before the hollows came along were measuring really poorly originally as well. So that has been my preference. Um, the sound characteristics of this uh, unit is very much in reminiscent of the DAC-3B and the D90 if you're used to those. It's sort of that along those lines of uh, sound characteristic. It's not like a ladder DAC or like the chord products where it's a little bit more kind of rounded and organic. This is more kind of reference and detail retrieval kind of DAC. Uh, this is until we activate Tube Mode or Tube Plus, which adds some of that euphoric harmonic distortion that Tubes provides, rounding out the sound nicely, making it a bit more pleasant. It's it's so versatile, honestly. Um, I did not always activate the Tube Mode. Sometimes uh, some headphones required the solid state, which sounded a lot uh, kind of more cohesive. Uh, the LCD5 being one of them. Sasvaras I did throw on this unit. Um, it gets Sasvaras going nicely. I wouldn't say it drives Sasvaras like the AHB2 does, or even the uh, 23R from Enlium. God, that name. Uh, Enlium uh, from South Korea. Barcoon previously. Um, but it does do pretty well for Sasvaras, but some of the best performance has been the LCD5. That's the overall sound, so should we get down to the nitty gritty? Let's discuss. As usual, we will use a single track uh, to break down the frequency response and the tonality and the characteristics of this uh, unit as a standalone unit using a track from the artist Spongle. The name of the track will be linked down below. It will be in the description. Have a listen to this while we break down the frequency response and how this unit performs. Um, now, this track starts with cellos. It's, it's very violent, it's very trailer-esque, it's very bottom heavy. And when you use the LCD5 with this unit, it drives it to the fullest of its capability. I've not heard such slam and vibrance and authority on any other headphone as I have on the LCD5 with this unit. It's absolutely spectacular. You get the swell of the sub bass, the impact of the mid bass. So starting with the sub bass, it's very texturally apparent. The authority of the rumble and tightness of the cellos in this category within the stage is very, very apparent. It makes your eardrums tingle in a very, very good way. And every time there's an impact from a chord, as the strings collide three or four notes together, you get that visceral impact which climbs from the sub bass into the mid bass category. It's got wonderful punch from kick drums and the authority and slam from a drum kit. The upper bass region is filled in and fleshed out perfectly so that the treble region never feels shrill. I did mention that the treble region is edge leading and is forward tilting a little bit due to that analytical nature of the DAC and the amplifier combo. Uh, I will tell you which aspect of the unit being the amplifier in this situation causes this uh, aspect, but we will break down the DAC by itself momentarily um, when it's going through the serene. Um, so the upper bass region is very edge leading for drums when the upper part of the drum crescendos and attacks. So using this track, when the horns kick in and they're in the upper bass category, it never feels as though the instrument is not resonating within its cavity very, very well. It actually is a very full sound. 
even using EDM such as Infected Mushrooms uh, Back to the Source album, you get full authority and full slam. Sometimes, honestly, <laughs> It can feel a little offensive how violent the base region on this unit is, in a very good way. Genuinely surprised. These things are hard to drive. These uh, LCD5s on the Serene, nah, no power. Even on the Ore, which was absolutely spectacular, the slam from the mid base and sub base on this unit has just taken my breath away. Genuinely. Approaching the lower mid-range uh, category on this uh, unit, when the track surpasses the swell of the music, you get those delicate single note strikes from guitars, etc. Or a single note uh, from the violin and from the cellos. It's uh, singularly apparent, vibrant and very cohesive. It's very clear very analytically correct. It gives a very analyzing texture to the note so that you can see it from all sides. The stage for this track is moderate. I wouldn't say it's overly large, like for example, the May or the Dave provides, but it's more of a look at what the music's doing. I'm showing you every aspect of it. And these are the filters that have been added to the instruments so that you can assess it correctly. Honestly, this unit is really, really useful for those of you who like editing, mixing, mastering, etc. It's It's really, really um, kind of cohesive to that narrative. Um, this is before you obviously activate the tubes. So the mid-range is open, it's lush, it's uh, engaging. Vocals in this category really do pop. They're very, very vivid. And it's, it's, they sort of literally like reflect off of the stage as if they're right there and you can almost touch them. Um, it's a very transparent DAC. Climbing up to the treble region when the track crescendos, this is where the leading edge of attack is a little bit too much for my subjective tastes. It's, it's not really rounding out too much. It really is showing you that what the track is doing. It's a little bit forward. It's very much in reminiscent of that uh, DAC we reviewed a very long time ago from Suncast. The HGDD one? SGDD one? It's been a quite it's been quite a while where after a while I find myself in the solid state mode I do actually get a little fatigued uh, by this DAC but I am very very treble sensitive and I'm very very sensitive to the upper mid-range categories so please bear that in mind a lot of you won't even have this issue the treble region extends quite well it's quite airy um, very, very resolving, very analytical, 100%. That is one characteristic of this unit that can't be denied, how transparent and high resolution it is. Um, it, it, it performs wonderfully in this category. This being a rough estimation of the frequency response of this unit, using the LCD5s as the main drivers. To drive this unit to show us what it's doing. This unit, uh, the LCD5 tonality is very, very, almost perfect, it's very accurate. Um, it's wonderful, especially if it's driven properly. If it's not, you've got the upper mid-range crescendo crash uh, discordant clashiness, which is a bit annoying, but never not resolving properly. It's just that it needs the perfect amount of current, voltage and synergy. Then you get absolutely beautiful, beautiful tonality from the LCD5s. So what happens when we go to tube mode. Let's discuss. Tube mode has been kind of a godsend on this little unit because it really does require it um, when you go from the solid state to uh, the tube mode. The solid state, like I said, is very analytical, very revealing. It's very, very analytical, very detailed, very revealing. Microdynamics on this unit is ridiculous. My goodness, does this thing slam. It, it's kind of nuts. For this size, I would never expect it. So, to calm that down a little bit, round it out, bring the beautiful tube harmonic distortion, such as the can behind me, a review for that will be coming shortly. Um, I would not say it's overly tuby. Uh, for those of you who are used to tubes, I would not say, I think it just adds enough, enough of a flavor. It, 
rolls off that treble region a little bit. It reduces the detail by a bit. Obviously, it's not as accurate as the solid state part of this unit, um, obviously, because it's introducing tubes in the, to the chain. So, um, but you get more of that euphoric nature. Um, putting the, what were you called? The atrium on this unit felt as though it was giving me a little more stage, a little more lushness, a little more of that tube loveliness that ZMF headphones kind of actually require to truly be engaged. And um, it was very handy. I mean, this unit's tiny. To be able to go to, okay, I fancy a little tube, not too much tube, a little tube, you go to tube. Give me a little more tube, you go to tube plus. And that's when, um, when you go to tube plus mode, the treble region is more rounded out. It's more softer. It's more pleasant. It's more, it becomes more engaging in a soulful kind of way, unlike the solid state aspect. Shall we discuss how this unit performs separately? So the DAC, when you take it out of this unit and go into another uh, pre, such as the Serene behind me, you find the stage expanses wonderfully. Like, uh, for example, if the stage is this big within the amplifier internally, the stage goes to twice as wide. It, it's kind of insane how much wider it is. And then the treble region, I told you I find it a little fatiguing after a couple of hours listening, that gets rounded out. It's more smoother. So that characteristic is definitely, is conducive to the amplifier inside this unit. Also, you lose a touch of the visceral violence from the mid bass and a little less authority in the sub bass. So you can tell that the amplifier in this unit is exceptional. It's actually adding those aspects to the DAC to form this cohesive, violent, detailed, transparent high resolution unit. The Serene is an incredible pre. $3,600, actually more expensive than this entire unit. So I've got no qualms in saying it's driving and showing and showcasing the DAC to this fullest capability. So if you are taking the DAC out of this unit, it is a little softer, it is a little more polite, and it is a little calmer in the detail aspect, but still pretty transparent and a good performer. In this category, I think this is where we can bring in the other DACs. In this category, when you take it out of its environment and you just use a DAC by itself, I will say it performs a little better than the DAC-3B behind me at 1700, but not quite on the levels of the Cord TT2 at 4500. That one has a bigger stage. Its edge of attack is a little more violent even when you take it out of the unit itself. Um, the what are you? The I think it's 96,000 tap filters on the core TT2 sh flexes its muscles and it really showcases. Uh, it's more organic. Um, but being able to add the tubes to the output stage when you're taking the DAC out of this, as I've been doing with the AHB2 behind me and using it as a pre, really does add that little bit of tubesy lusciousness, which is absolutely wonderful. It's so versatile. You can just, if you've got other units on your desk, you can just mix and match to your heart's content and then yank it off the desk whenever you need to go to a hotel or vacation or something and take it with you because it really isn't that big. This fits in a backpack pretty easily. You might have more trouble with this though. This is quite heavy. That's a big beast. Um, comparing the DAC by itself compared to the May, the May has a bigger stage, it's more organic, but the leading edge of attack, I think I might give to the signature its leading edge of attack is quite apparent um it, the may sometimes can feel a little more rounded and a little bit more polite but that is the nature of nos mode and uh obviously the ladder dacs but when you go into uh upsampling mode using hq player or the uh what are you call the chord m scaler that gap considerably widens. So the DAC in this unit, I think performs okay. It's a pretty good DAC, but I think uh, it's more, 
It's better when it's a whole cohesive unit than a singular unit, but uh, like when you separate the pre or separate the DAC, etc. Like the Core TT2, the sum of the unit is far greater than the unit by itself. So we have covered the tube mode, we have covered the DAC by itself, as a pre, it's pretty good. I don't think it's on the levels of the gold point stepped attenuator, that's at $500, but that measures incredibly well. But it's very difficult to actually test the pre by itself uh, with another DAC. Obviously because of the uh, DAC and uh, the amplifier and the um, pre being intertwined together, including the tubes. I think most people would buy this, would buy it for the convenience, standalone unit and the functionality, which has been exceptional. Okay, let's talk about some of the headphones performances on this unit. Um, the Fostex 909s, uh, I did not find too pleasing with this unit. Um, obviously because when you go into uh, solid state mode, this unit is lead edge kind of leaning in the treble region and uh, the, the Fostex 909s are very, very, very treble forward, like exponentially. Even using the tube mode, I could not kind of tame it down a bit, but the bass region was pretty good. Um, headphones such as the Atrium, which have got a laid back treble region, was really good because this actually emphasized that laid back nature by bringing a little more detail out of the whole situation. And then obviously you engage the tube mode to give her that organic nature a little bit more, that tubiness, and that performed quite well. The sub bass and bass category for all of these headphones, including the LCD5, has been exceptional. Um, but for a lot of headphones, I found that it became more of an analytical listen rather than a lush, kind of engaging listen in the solid state mode. But in the tube mode, that obviously brings it back a little bit. So I would put it that the LCD5 performed the best out of any other headphone I have had on this unit. Um, IEMs is a bit of a tricky one. Sometimes I've got radio signal uh, pickups because of how sensitive IEMs are, even in low gain mode, but it wasn't often and it, I could not always repeat the situation. So I could not quite understand what it was on the desk that was causing such an issue, um, but it, had, it did happen occasionally and I thought it's worth mentioning. But it wasn't a consistent thing. It was very odd, very, very odd. Um, because the, ro the uh, radio signals, like the antenna and stuff, does not shut down, I believe, in this unit when um, it's not being used. So maybe that's what the problem was, I don't know. But like USB is galvanically isolated, uh, obviously the uh, coax and everything else is as well. So those perform extraordinarily well, they're wonderful. Um, but for IEMs, in that situation, we got some of that buzzing nature from the uh, system or whatever signal it was picking up from around itself. But the LCD5 on this unit is transparent, it's detailed, it's very punchy, it's very sub-bass, emphasized. It's been an engaging experience. certain aspects of this unit. So, you can stick a bunch of music onto a USB stick and use the internal player and um, app to use them. But as far as I know, you can't select artists and albums. I couldn't, I think it might be a screen reader problem or not, I'm not too sure, but it was good for a shuffling emphasis, but uh, I could not actually individually select, so that was a bit problematic for me. Uh, another one being I could not get the Wi-Fi to connect to this unit using the IFI app, but Ethernet worked perfectly. So I'm not sure if it's a 2.5 kilohertz or 5 kilohertz uh, kind of LAN situation and Wi-Fi situation, but uh, I did have uh, problems actually connecting this to the network via wireless. But um, Ethernet, absolutely no problem. As soon as it was connected, it was picked up and it was just performing really well. And it just became part of the unit itself. It is one of those units um, that has everything pretty much inbuilt that you need for a nice desktop setup. It doesn't take up much footprint. Uh, you've got obviously a remote to access it from afar. Um, and 
it, it it's very very cohesive within itself um, it's got a lot of functionality and it mitigates a lot of need for bits of equipment around your desk such as USB cleaners such as like uh, a Pi or a Zenstream and a Pre and maybe even to a certain point for those of you who like just a touch of tubes tubes uh, Obviously, for those of you who are deep into tubes, like we are here, um, that's a completely different situation because this only gives you a touch of tubes and you can't roll the tubes, uh, not easily anyway, so yeah. Um, but you do get a lot of functionality with this unit. So what are some of the caveats uh, of this unit? Um, I think a couple of them would be for me is that the it's sometimes a little too analytical in the treble region and it fatigues me a little bit and some of you who are treble sensitive when you're using the solid state mode this could be a, just like me a bit problematic um, after a couple of hours it's it it feels as though it's smooth but there is so much energy up there that you just you want to walk away from the desk a little bit because it's like it makes you concentrate a little too much um, on the details and stuff um, and it, it can be a little fatiguing. Um, the second issue being sometimes it picks up antenna issues and stuff um, for IEMs and very very low sensitive uh, impedances um, that I could not regularly recreate which was rather frustrating so it's, it's rather difficult to tell if it's just this unit or it was specifically those IEMs or what the hell it was, something around the desk um, and um, obviously when you go into tube mode in the beginning as the tubes are warming up you do get like some ringing from the tubes. This is an innate part of tubes unfortunately but that does tend to go away. So if you knock the desk you can hear it ring within the unit but um, as the tubes warm up this gets mitigated by quite a lot. Um, no QC problems here. Uh, I did have a little issue with the volume knob because obviously this is a demo unit. You've no idea how people are kind of treating these things when they're on their desk and they get sent back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The volume knob was a little loose, but we tightened it. There's a Pentacon uh, uh, screw on here and now it's perfect. Beautiful. Very nice. It's a very, very beautiful unit. I mean, look at this thing. For the amount of features it packs, it's quite tremendous. So I think those are some of the caveats I have uh, with this unit. Price to performance ratio, it's absolutely ridiculous. So let's talk about the conclusion. Should you buy the IFI Pro IDSD Signature? That's a quadruple barrel naming scheme. That's, that's, <laughs> it's quite, it's quite long. Um, Yes, because I don't think there is another unit on the planet that packs as much things into one unit as this does. And I was at Can Jam London two weeks ago and I did not see anything at this price point that delivers the same performance with the same amount of functionality and features as this at this price point. I don't think there is one. Even jumping from this to the Core TT2 at four and a half thousand, it doesn't have a streamer. It doesn't have tubes. It's got nice filters though. I prefer the filters on the cord compared to this one. But uh, this has tubes, this has streaming, this has USB connection, micro USB connection, uh, studio mode obviously for higher voltages, uh, the word clock inputs for a better clock if you fancy it, a much nicer remote, it's aluminium. Yes, I think you should buy this. If you are a person who just wants one thing, who just wants a small, compact, high-performing unit at your desk, who wants as many functionalities as possible packed into a little unit, and if for, the, for, for those of you who carry a backpack with you and are constantly like in hotels and stuff, I think you should buy this, genuinely. This is a fantastic unit and it really does give you a lot of functionality in a very, very, very small form factor. Well done, IFI. I think you've achieved something wonderful here, genuinely. And I mean this genuinely. We play with a lot of equipment here, uh, and it's rare to see one that has as many functionalities as this freaking thing does. This is insane. The tonality is, as we discussed, uh, analytical and tubes. Um, so. Let me know if that is something you prefer. And also let me know down in the comment section if you own one of these. 
What headphones do you run with it and how have you been finding it? And also its counterpart, the iCan. Hopefully I can get that for review soon and see what the deal is there. Um, and uh, this sits on top of that one. So you can have a massive stack. That thing is really powerful, I believe. So it'd be interesting to actually review that as well. So let's do the scores. For this unit, build quality, I would give three strong tigers. Functionality, four strong tigers. Features, five tigers, because I don't think there's another unit that does as much as this does. Power, performance, and not the need to worry. Four solid tigers, because it can go from IEMs even to Sasvaras to a certain extent. Uh, I think the ore performs a little better for Sasvaras. Uh, check out the review down below, because I did compare it with this unit and the TT2 in that review. Um, so it pretty much gives you a lot of functionality with a very small form factor. I will give this unit genuinely four tigers out of five because I don't think there's anything else like it. Well done IFI and thank you for sending this unit in for review. I appreciate it. And if you want reviews like this uh, and before it gets on YouTube, I think currently we are like eight to ten reviews ahead of YouTube, uh, consider joining the Patreon. All the information will be down below. If not, your like, your subscription, joining our public Telegram chat is all I require from you. It's been wonderful having the time with this unit. I've genuinely enjoyed it. Until next time, I'm Koji Sio. Peace.